Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to IPDAY's Webinar Wednesdays. We're so glad that you could join us today. We wanted to start this year out with some resources that you might feel useful as you begin your academic year. Today, Bonnie Gooden and I will show you some helpful resources as you continue to build your knowledge for implementing a standards-based instructional program. Today, facilitating the call with me is Bonnie Gooden, our national consultant and Florida IP Day trainer, no stranger to all of us. And we thank Bonnie for being on the call with us today. On the call with us also um, in a listen-only mode are some Florida Department of Education staff. And we just wanted to thank the Florida Department of Education for supporting IP Day through the leadership funds that we're able to continue to do this great work for all of you in the field. I wanted to give a big shout out to our new state director, Carol Bailey. I know you all received um, information from the chancellor and we welcome her with open arms and I'm sure that all of you will get to know her as we go through this academic year and hopefully you'll get to meet her face to face if any of you will be at the ACE conference. So, Thank you from the Florida Department of Education. So before we get started with the webinar, I just wanna go over some um, housekeeping rules. I wanna let all of you know that you are in, um, your attending microphones are muted. This helps us reduce the noise that often surrounds us. So if you have a question, we do want to hear from you and we ask that you please type it into the Q&A section of your screen. We'll be monitoring these questions throughout the webinar, and we'll make sure that we respond to your questions and comments. If you have any technical questions or any concerns regarding that, please type those in as well. We'll be monitoring them, and we'll be able to assist you as needed. I wanna also bring to your attention, like always, today's webinar is being recorded, and it is archived. Just give us about 48 hours after this webinar, and when you go into the IPDA website, you're gonna be able to see it there, including the PowerPoint, the activity, and the video. So for those of you that, uh, for any staff that was not able to see this webinar, you can let them know that it's out there and available for them to use. So in this session, let's go over a few of the objectives of what we'll be doing today. We'll be talking about that adult learner. I'm really interested, Bonnie, in hearing about this new generation of Generation Z because I'm not really too familiar with what that all includes. So Bonnie's going to go over that with us. And then we're going to talk about standards and assessment tools to drive our instruction. As always, we're going to look for resources for you so you have them hands-on and ready to use in your, in your sites. And at the end, I'm gonna to talk to you about some upcoming events and some latest and greatest resources that we have out there that we're um, developing and continuing to develop as we go along. So Bonnie, let me turn it over to you and we'll get started on who are our students. Thanks, June. And you know, with each school year, we do look out and we see new types of students, new students. So before you and I get started talking about the adult student, I'd be really interested in knowing from the field, with the beginning of this school year, as you looked out onto your new classroom, what is a word or phrase about this new adult learner that initially came to your mind? And if you will, type in that word, the first word or phrase that comes to mind about who are your students. Type it into the Q&A for us, please. Uh, we thank the first one of you who came out friendly. I like that word, immature. Women, interesting, diverse. Functionally illiterate, that's an interesting phrase. And then we have inmates. Now, I know we have well over 50 people, so we should have a few more words than this, June, before we go on. 
Bonnie, check the chat button. There's some um, putting them in the chat. Ah, struggling adults. Yes, we do have displaced folks, especially with the horrible storm that came through Puerto Rico. Frustrated, insecure. We have a couple immature that has come through. Very interesting. Multi-languages, very much so. You know, June, this looks very different than when I started in adult ed. Um, I won't tell you how many years ago, but our audience has really changed. And one person just put in reserve. They don't like to ask for help always. So we have a very different looking audience than we ever have before. And that diversity in both where they come from and their age really continues to be there for us. And it is an interesting thing as we look forward. June was mentioning a little bit ago Generation Z, and that's kind of anyone who was born after 1996, 97. There's some discussion on that. But those are the new folks, and the projections are they're going to be 40% of the population by 2020. So they're a group that we're just starting to see in our classroom, and they are very, very different. Again, each generation brings with them some very interesting learning styles, some very interesting um, attitudes towards education. And so as we look at that, we still have some of our traditional folks who come into our classroom, and those are the folks that, you know, they are older, I hate to use that word, but about 73 on up, but you look at five very different generations that we have in the classroom. And with those different generations, we really have to look at what type of a learner they are and how they learn best. If I look at the traditionalists, those are the folks who are in our classroom, and they do like that structured classroom, that traditional classroom. They grew up with rote memorization. Many of us continue to be in education. We're what we call the baby boomers. You always know we're baby boomers because we love to tell stories. I always laughingly say when I'm in meetings, just remember I'm a baby boomer. I think my kids and grandkids have numbered my stories. But if I'm a baby boomer, the thing that I like best in a classroom is I like that group interaction and discussion. I want to be part of the decision making. Now, many of us, will be Generation Xers, and, and they learn very differently. They're much more independent, and they like the alternative learning activities that they can go out and do it themselves, as opposed to having to always do it in group work, but they do like that feedback. This was really the first generation that started doing more online skill building. We have seen our millennials, or our Gen uh, wise come in for some time. They do want to do collaborative learning. They like to be networked. They want it to be a two-way learning experience. Sometimes we say, those are the folks who will say, well, gee, would it be okay if I did it this way instead? Because it's going to work better for me. So there again, they like that individualized feedback, but they also like to have that two-way learning experience. Then our youngest ones, our Generation Z, are very much into the handhelds, the, the pocket mobile internet-based kind of learning. They are very, very visual. Um, quite honestly, listening to lectures is torture for them. I never realized how pocket mobile they are until I started working with a grandson over the summer who was doing an online class and he was going to use his lovely mobile phone to do all the work he needed to do on algebra, or actually it was geometry this summer. And I said, you know, forget this. I need at least a computer so I can see it. Never realizing how much Generation Z is into their handhelds. That gives you kind of just that brief overview of, of who's in our classroom. And if you're one that really wants to get into all of that generational divide and how do we teach better, how can we become more inclusive and still not lose our minds, we're going to have an actual um, webinar October 10th that digs a little bit deeper, not just who they are, but how they learn and what kinds of strategies we can use in our classroom. So this will not be the last that you hear about this type of adult student.
But as June said earlier, what we want to do in this webinar is just hit a number of things as we come back to the classroom. Some of them may be new to us, but some of these ideas, you know, we just need that little bit of a refresher. So let's look briefly at two words that we've seen for many years. One is andragogy and one is pedagogy. And there's really a difference in that because we all know that teaching the adult ed student is very different than teaching a student who's in K-12, especially those students who are K-8 and earlier high school. These students have a whole lot of skills and they want to be taught differently. And so as we look at this, um, Dr. Stephen Lieb is one of the foremost um, experts today in the field of adult ed. He said when we're looking at motivating our adult students, and of course we all want them highly motivated so that we keep them, so that they persist and can be retained. His comment is that not just in learning, but in motivational factors for learning, adults differ greatly from children. Not surprising. Adults in the classroom and in their lives want to desire uh, those social relationships. And we see a lot of that happening in our adult ed classroom. Adults need to meet those external expectations. You know, maybe it's the fact that my supervisor has said, I need to upgrade my skills. So into adult ed I come so that those skills can get better honed. There's also a motivational factor that Adults want to learn how to better serve others. They need those skills and, of course, professional advancement. Sometimes it's just, you know, I want to get out of where I am now. And so, you know, I haven't been back to school. I haven't read a book, etc. I want to have that stimulation for myself. Of course, sometimes the motivation is cognitive or personal interest. I always thought about taking that class. I always thought about doing that. And of course, sometimes it's that requirement, that licensure that comes up. Those are motivational factors that can differ greatly from what we see in a K-12 system. But Dr. Lieb also talks about when we're working with adult students, there's a number of things that we need to also do differently. Number one, we need to look at grouping styles that are best for both the student and the task. So there again, I'm looking at students who like individualized learning. I'm looking at students who like to work in large groups, small groups. I have to look not only at them, but also what am I teaching? What is going to work best there? You know, some educators firmly believe that as a teacher, we have to mix the groups so that all students of all levels are represented in each group. Oftentimes we call that heterogeneous. But others believe that the teacher must organize those students by ability levels. As we look into um, the works of folks like Marzano and Pickering, they really talk about that there's advantages to both. It really goes then into what are we teaching? The other thing, and we see this so much of the time, especially with our younger students who question, why do I need to learn this? So here again, in our classrooms, we need to make sure that students understand why they are learning something. What is the purpose? And many of our younger students aren't going to buy the, the bit of, you have to learn it for the test. No, uh, again, very, very different. I think this is the next bullet is something that we've done for years, and that is respecting that our students have different learning styles, and oftentimes those styles are very different from the way you or I learn. And so that sometimes makes us have to kind of step back and say, hmm, okay, how can I do this? I may not be in my comfort zone for a while. So those are the kinds of things, again, that the experts are saying experiential learning, hands-on. We know that many of our students learn best by not just learning in the classroom, but how can I apply it elsewhere? Something that we've been talking about for years as we look at contextualized learning. The other thing is, and this is so difficult to do when we've got so many students coming and going, but when the student is ready, we have to be there. And again, that we encourage them and support their learning because they are 
adult students. So as we look at andragogy, which is the teaching of adults, versus pedagogy, which is the teaching of students, of children, there really are these basic differences. But June, you know, it's not just about who the adult student is and about andragogy versus pedagogy. We have something else that's entered our world, and that is standards-based education. Can you talk to us a little bit about standards? What are they, and, and what does that mean to us? Oh, sorry, Bonnie. So you, uh, wait a minute. Go ahead, Bonnie, you go. Okay, as we're looking at a standards-based education, it has changed the culture of teaching in our programs because no longer can we just take a look at a test, et cetera. We are standard-based oriented. So as we look at our agencies across the state of Florida, if you think about your adult ed agency, and if I said to you, there's a culture there, and your culture may be very different from the northern part of our state to the southern part, from the rural to the urban. If you had to come up with one word or short phrase to describe the agency in which you work, the agency's adult ed program, what would that word be? And if you can, again, go ahead and just type that into the Q&A box. I like this word, linked. That's a great word to, you know, um, describe a very positive part of adult education. Someone else. Exploration and variety. Wow. I like those words. I couldn't have always said that about where I work. Targeted. Progression. Trying to provide hope, helping others progress and engage. Another exploration. Unpredictable. Now that's a really honest word because an adult ed in today's world, sometimes it is very unpredictable. Differentiated. Diversified, engaged, and targeted. A culture of safety and hope. These are some great words for a culture. There's times I think sometimes describing the culture of where we teach can be much more positive than setting up all the mission statements, you know, that are out there that we can never remember. If I know that my primary focus is to build a culture of exploration, variety, safety, hope, a culture that differentiates for our students, progresses. All of those things are absolutely wonderful words. Oriented. I really, these are great words. And think about that. You may want to go back to your site and have everyone identify what do they think when they think of the culture of the adult ed program. Are the words different? from the different generations of teachers with whom you work? Are the words different from what you thought they were? Again, we should be teaching to the culture in which we work. But we were talking a little bit about standards before. And standards have become very much a part of our adult ed programs. And that phrase, standards-based instructional program, is out there strong. and it's got to be both in the GD, the ABE, and our ESOL classrooms. It is everywhere. But if it's a standards-based instructional program, and that's what is required of us, then what standards do we teach, and why are they important? For those of you who are veterans today, you know where these standards are, and you know what you should be incorporating into your classroom. But for many of us who are new, and let's face it, if we all think back to when we first started out in adult ed, I guarantee that just like me, you came in sideways. In fact, I'll never forget. I went in for an interview. I needed, you know, that little extra income, and, and I had been told about teaching in adult ed. 
So I went in and, and the director said, great, you're hired. You'll be teaching two nights a week. You can start tonight. I said, oh, okay. Uh, what do I teach? Well, there's some books in the room. You can go ahead and use those. Does that sound familiar to anyone? If it does, just like me, you came in sideways. And at that point, we didn't even have standards. It was called, okay, I guess I start at the beginning of the book, even though I don't think that's the best, mess, best method. And it took me a while to understand what all the assessment tools were and how I could use those. So in some respects, having a standards-based education has made some of those beginning steps a little bit easier. In fact, I'm going to do a quick um, take a look here at just comments, making sure that no one has a Q&A that we need it to answer. We have a few other phrases of goal-oriented and welcoming, which I love too. But let's take a look at the standards. Now, what you're going to see in this webinar today are a lot of URLs, a lot of websites. Please do not get worried. Uh, when you download the work from the website, you will notice that all of these URLs are on one page, hyperlinked, so you're going to have them all. So one of the first things I want everyone to realize is, first of all and foremost, standards aren't a total curriculum. They don't tell you how you should be teaching. They tell you what students should know or be able to do. But there again, how you teach your students will depend upon who they are, their ages, um, their diversity, what they want to do. In fact, most of the time when people will say, what are the best materials out there, books, etc." My first comment to them is, you know what? I don't know your students and I don't know you well enough. So what you have to do is take a look at who your students are, how you teach, and you go ahead and select things in that manner that, of course, fit the standards that are required out there. Hopefully everyone knows that to get the standards for adult education in the state of Florida, you go to Florida's Department of Education at fldoe.org and you click on the link and you take a look at the fact that, and hopefully it'll come up in just a moment, that here we have those 2018-19 adult education curriculum frameworks. When you click on those, you will find that you have frameworks for ESOL, for ABED, ABE, for GED prep. You have um, a variety of things there. And so this should be your first step, your first location that you always go to to get the latest and the greatest of what's happening in Florida with curriculum frameworks, with technical assistance papers, etc. This should be your go-to. And if you've not been there yet, you're a new teacher this year, I will say to you today, please go out, download the frameworks, take a look at the papers that are out there so that it becomes just that regular visit from you to know what is happening and what's going on. Now, is, as you're looking at the frameworks, and again, this is a quick review. If you want more information on the frameworks on the Florida IPDE website, there are actual workshops on both um, language arts and on math on how to read these. But very briefly, when you're looking at a framework, what you're looking at is what we call an anchor standard. If you came out of K through 12, this will look very similar to what you were used to teaching from in K-12 with that anchor standard. You'll notice that there's a level. Right here we have levels A, B, E, 1, 2, 3, and 4, better known as NRS, National Reporting System levels. And you'll notice that this standard, being able to read closely to determine what text says, basically goes from a easier level, asking and answering questions, all the way up into answering the five W's and H. Again, higher order skills as we go up to level three and even higher level four. So as we're looking, this one came out of ABE reading. We need to know that this particular standard progresses from an easier to a more complex level of reading. 
the focus of the standards there, and of course, the level appropriate expectations. Now, this is basically how RLA, language arts, as well as reading are set up. When you look at the anchor standards for math, they look just a little bit different. In fact, there will be a, a lot of different types of webinars coming up and a math matrix that will help you put a little more meaning to this. But here again, we have levels, we have strands, and instead of calling them anchor standards, they call them domains. We have the standard then listed, and we had the benchmarks, or basically the substandards. So all of the standards that we see in Florida look like this, and it will be really important for you to download those knowing that is what you need to teach. If standards-based education is something new, then you may want to take a look at some outside resources, and here again you've got the URLs. I won't tell you that they're exciting reading, but they are great resources to download and again, as an adult educator, have in your library. There's also um, proficiency standards for ESOL, not only the ESOL curriculum frameworks from Florida, but some proficiency standards that have recently come out. Again, if this is your field, these should be the resources that you have as part of your educational library. And Bonnie, remember, I just want to remind the audience of all of the workshops that were done on the college and career readiness standards and all the alignment and all of this work is, is you know, on the IFDA website. So there's tons of resources out there for them to go back and uh, review if they need to. You know, that's great. And if I remember right, we have done a number of workshops also from Florida uh, Department of Ed on the ESOL standards. So there again, make sure that you know who is available to you at the state level and make sure that you know what is currently on the Florida IP Day regarding standards if it's something that, again, you're not well versed in yet. If you are teaching GED, then the place you need to go is GD.com because the test is based, again, on the College Career Readiness Standards, but because of the type of test it is, again, it is not an assessment for purposes of placement. It is indeed a credentialing assessment where students come out with, quote, the credential of a Florida high school diploma. And so as we're looking at different resources from there, you will want to make sure that one of the things that you download are the performance level descriptors. And the performance level descriptors from GED Testing Service, again, tell us what we should be teaching and the skills that are necessary for each of the performance levels. So if I'm teaching a GED prep class, my students should have mastery of level two, with level one being, for lack of a better term, a pre-GED area. So these are the resources, again, you should be downloading. The performance level descriptors tell us what students need to do in order to pass that test. There's another resource from GED testing service that you might find um, very useful as well. And that's high impact indicators. And those are some of the standards that GD testing service found were widely applicable across different areas. Often they saw that they received very light coverage and yet students were missing them. And that uh, really a lot of them were the students who just didn't quite pass the test. They lend themselves very well to straightforward instruction and they are definitely based on research. I will note for you that uh, one of the folks in the field, Ann Morgan will be doing a number of webinars that deal with high impact uh, indicators and how we can use those in the GED classroom to teach from a thematic approach. So if you're in the GED classroom, and you have no clue what PLDs are, then that will be something that you will want to make sure that you access the materials from the Florida IPDA website and that you attend some of these webinars that are coming forward. So regardless of the standards, what we need to do, whether they're ABE, GED, 
ESOL, et cetera. What standards do is they help us assess our students' current skill levels. They help us shape learning activities. They help us add different perspective to the lesson plans we're using. They help us in selecting educational materials. And they also help us determine when our students are ready to test the next time. So as we're looking at a standards-based education, those are the kinds of things as, again, a veteran or a new teacher that you want to keep in mind as we start this new school year. So, June, we've covered the adult student, we've covered a little bit of andragogy versus pedagogy, and we've covered a little bit of standards. So I'm going to stop for just a moment and find out if anyone has any questions before we go on. And Bonnie, these tools are so essential because now we have tests that are aligned to these standards and aligned to these college and career readiness, things that we need to be teaching in the classroom. So it really gives us a really good perspective on identifying the gaps that our students need, remediating and focusing and targeting that, uh, that instruction in the classroom. You know, that's so true as we look forward. And I notice that we have a number of folks on the webinars who are working with correctional facilities. And sometimes having to implement some of these standards does require a little more creativity, shall we say, uh, because there are so many resources that our friends in corrections do not have access to. And so consequently, as that's why I'm a strong believer that how you teach them has to be an individual um, kind of skill because it's going to look very different in a correctional facility. And even just some of the choice of materials, the choice of topics that we use has to be very different. And as you review our resources, you're going to see that we're giving you those options in those resources. Uh, if you are serving in those correction facilities. And I do have one question. Do you know if the new textbook adoption will include references to the PLD? Um, most of the time, and I do not know that for sure, that will be a question I need to ask someone, but most of the time when we're looking at GED level materials, if you go out to the GED.com website, they do not indicate which are best, but what they do indicate is they had an outside, GED testing service did, an outside um, company assess whether certain materials aligned with the standards that are required for the GED test. So there again, if you've got materials that are aligned, aligned with the college and career readiness standards, then they will cover the performance level descriptors. Okay, let's take just a brief look at another area that all adult educators need to be concerned about, and that's assessment. We've got basically two types of assessment. We have formative and we have summative. Formative, in my you know, considered opinion, is one of the most important because that is the type of assessment that we use as part of the instructional process. And it's very much based upon the instructor providing that ongoing assessment of what the student's able to do, not able to do, and it definitely drives our instruction. But we also know that summative assessment, things such as the TAPE, the GED Ready, et cetera, are also a very useful and very necessary, not just for, of course, student skills, but also in the continuation of our funding, which, although it sounds awful, it is what it is. And so as we look at assessment in the state of Florida, one of the things that you should download, and I will tell you, I'll give you a little hint, the current assessment uh, technical assistance paper is from 2017-18. We have been told that the new one will be ready uh, to go for the ACE conference. So in a couple weeks, we will have the brand new 2018-19 technical assistance paper. And so as you look again at this website, which is also included in your workbook guide, 
I will tell you that, yes, this one looks great. Lots of wonderful information for you to read, but also realize that there will be a brand new one coming out that will include all the latest greatest on the TAB 11 and 12, as well as all of the other uh, information, all the other materials. I'm always surprised, June, by the aspect that we do have a lot of folks who have no clue that there are technical assistance papers that come out of our Department of Ed, our adult ed. And so here again, just as a, a heads up, realize that you do need to go out and you do need to make sure that the one that you're pulling down in a couple weeks is 2018 and 19, because just like the standards, the standards from past years do remain on the website. So again, we want to make sure we're working from the latest greatest. Yeah, very important, Bonnie, because that technical assistance paper is your source document. So many times we hear things out in the field and we're like, wait, we've got to tie this back to a source document. And when you can do that with your staff and tell them where it is in that Florida, you know, assessment technical assistance paper, it's very helpful. Oh, I agree. I agree. Okay, let's just take a look at, at two very common assessment tools that we do work with. We work with this new tape coming out. And if you are interested in knowing more on the new tape, I'll give a very quick um, update. There will be a full session at the fall workshops that are coming out from Florida Ip Day. There are also a number of online materials that are being developed as we speak um, through Jane Silveria and again the Florida Ip Day and the Florida Department of Ed. So there will be a wealth of materials dealing with TABE. There's already a number of materials on GED Ready. I will tell you that TABE, again, just like GD Ready, is aligned with the College Career Readiness Standards, and it does assist us in refining instruction. For those of you who are asking, when will the new books come out for TABE in 11 and 12? What I'll tell you is what the publishers have told me. There will be those small little workbooks, um, basically, you know, just kind of a, a quick skill and drill, but the publishers have stated over and over that their ABE books that were put out when College Career Readiness Standards came out in 2015 will not be replaced by new ones. Why? The standards are the standards. So those books that you purchased maybe two years ago are good. So there again, take a look at those and realize that you're not going to get all of these brand new, big, thick books. And as you look at some of these books that may come out with some new alignment, make sure that you ask for the correlation charts because this will help you immensely as you're as you look at those P as you look at domains and skill levels, you'll be able to use that correlation chart and highlight exactly where it's located. Definitely, very definitely. Okay, as we look forward again, um, the TABE 11 and 12, how do you use it? Just note that you will have an individual profile, an individual score report. And for the purpose of this webinar, we've not given you everything. We'll go through it more in a face-to-face -face workshop. But just note that here again, the individual score report provides you with the basics. It provides you with your individual's name, the number of points, the level of tests they took, the score, the scale score, but it also provides you with the performance category, whether they did well with proficiency, non-proficiency, and the skills that there again, what are the skills that they either had difficulty with and as you look at, you can say, hmm, okay, this student had partial proficiency in reading. So let me look at the reading and find out what are some of the areas that I need to go back and make sure that that student works on just a little bit more. Or maybe I need to make sure that, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that are included in my workbook. 
workbooks. In fact, I often say sometimes our workbooks just don't give us enough. I'll never forget asking the question of an audience once how many pages in their workbooks covered the Pythagorean theorem. And I think it was like two maybe three, not enough to really teach the skill. So those are things that there again, we need to look at as we use the assessment tools. Two questions that came out that I wanna quickly answer just so that we don't forget them. One is the tape correlations will come from whatever publisher you're using. So if you're using McGraw-Hill, if you're using Steck Vaughan, if you're using Paxson, et cetera, that company has done the correlation pages. So you'll need to just contact your sales rep there. The other comment was about PLDs and the easiest route to find your performance level descriptors is go to ged.com or use your search engine and just uh, type in GED performance level descriptors. Easiest route to get to those. And Bonnie, before you move on to this, it's just really important for us to really hone in on these domains because we, we really need to become really fluent on what these domains mean because we need to drill down into that skill level when this report comes back, comes back. So this, you're gonna see really a lot of correlation on these domains, but you really need to understand what the meaning of the key ideas are and the craft and structure, uh, structure of, this, of this particular one that we're showing you now, but all the domains are different. When you get to the map, you're gonna see the map domains are the, exactly the same domains as they are on the, um, on the Florida curriculum you know, standards. You're gonna see those domains the same on the map matrix that we do. So all this is become, gonna become really familiar with you as you go along. And we're gonna be providing a lot of support in these areas. There's gonna be a module that will be developed through the Department of Education and IFDE that will really focus in on really getting into this individual score report because it's important as you facilitate that student after they take that, that test, because we want them to remediate, target what they need, and take it again and be successful and move on. So true. Um, the other area you need to know is GED. The GED test also has enhanced score reports. And there will be another webinar on that of taking you digging a little deeper. But for now, realize that each of your students who signs up for my GED, and when they take either the GED ready or the actual official GED test, gets a score report that also includes not only the skills that they did well in, but the skills that they need to work on. The other thing that the score book, uh, report gives them are depending upon what books or materials they use, either online or text, it gives them the pages or the lessons that they should cover that here again will help them remediate or go a little bit deeper into the skill. So very quickly, a GED enhanced score report this one would show from a GD ready that it's too close to call, which says to me the student needs to work a while before he or she takes the actual test. But you can see it also gives how can I score higher. And this particular person clicked in that um, he or she had the Steck Vaughn test prep book. So that's what he or she wanted to use to get materials. Here again, it tells them what kinds of skills they can improve. And those skills that they can improve are the standards, but simply written. Written for a student in mind rather than the educational ease oftentimes that we use in our standards. So here again, everything a student needs to know off of a score report. As an instructor, just realize that you should have access to those either by your students sending them or talking with your department of how you can get those. Last but not least, of course, we know that we're also using the CASAS and there's a number of things happening with that assessment tool. They again are continuing to get uh, NRS approval for the whole series of tests. And so at this point, they have um, 
seven-year NRS approval for the reading. They've submitted their math goals. Um, a lot of these things are happening. So if ESAW is the area in which you're teaching, you just need to stay involved in all the information that's coming out of DOE as well as it's coming out of CASAS. Okay, um, we, have a, we have a question that I want to address about okay. uh, material for tape nine and ten. I just want to uh, reiterate a few points for you that for, nine and ten or eleven, twelve. No, it's regarding the materials, destroying the okay. materials for nine and ten. So I just want to review a few little points with that. So let me just tell you that students may first off, students may not be reported to the state with nine and ten scores after twelve thirty one. Okay, that's number one. All paper-based test booklets must be shredded after that expiration date. And text booklets may not be used as practice tests or study materials. So I, that's, I hope that answers the question about the materials regarding the nine and 10. Excellent, thank you, June. Okay. You know, one of the things that I wish I had had was a list of some of the professional organizations, instructional sites, et cetera. Because again, that's something as a new instructor, we don't know where to go. Sometimes even as a veteran instructor, we may not have all those resources. So the next few slides, we're just going to highlight just a few of the important sites that you all need to have you know, close at hand remembering that the list is going to be included in your workbook. The first one up there is the federal agency, OCTE. And I like to tell folks to sign up for their newsletters because that way you learn more about what's happening from the federal adult ed. And of course we know that those things impact us. It is what it is. And so if you've never gone out to the OCTE site, I'd strongly recommend you go out. Remember again, this is the federal site. The next is the Florida and the other is the Florida Literacy Coalition. Both of them will give you some excellent information. And again, these are our two professional um, organizations in the state of Florida. So don't think, oh my goodness, Florida literacy is just for students who are at a certain level. You'll find that that particular site also has materials that even uh, click up to GED. Ace of Florida, again, not just about the conference, but there again, a number of materials. So those two sites should be your statewide professional organizations that you do go out to and that you highlight those things. We do have a federal organization called COABE, which has always, once a year, a huge conference. They're having a, um, a virtual conference coming up. But even if you do not join that organization, there are a lot of materials on the website. They do free webinars as well. And so there again, these four governmental and professional organizations organizations are some that you really need to click into. And of course, like we said before, Florida DOE should also be one. If you are um, ESOL, of course, TESOL, Teachers for ESOL, is one that you need to be aware of as well. We have everything from um, NASLIN to LINX to World Education, all sites that give you not only information dealing with adult ed, but depending upon the site, it gives you a lot of resources and research information. So those are the kinds of things that you'll want to look at. If you are dealing with ABE, GED, even some of our ESOL students, and you want to know where the materials for GED are, they changed their website a few months ago to GED.com. Now, when you open up GED.com, you're going to see that it says log in and sign up. Do not worry about that because what they've done is they've put together the test takers website along with the educators and a administrator's website. So when you click to gd.com, click on educators and administrators. And I'm going to say the same thing that I say forever. And that is when you get into that site, go 
down to the bottom and sign up for their in-session newsletter. You want to be the first person who knows the things, and so in-session will be your, your first route into knowing something first best. This is a newsletter where you'll find out when the GD Ready gets put on a lesser price. This is the site when folks signed up to it, they were the first ones who knew that there would not be a short answer for 2018. So very much worth it. And this is where you'll go to get things like the performance level descriptors, some teaching re resources, there's tutorials, and they also have an every other month webinar called Tuesdays for Teachers. Again, um, there is a test taker part of that, and for those of you who are new, you'll want to make sure that your GED level students do sign up, so all of those materials are there for them to access. And there's just a whole lot of other stuff on that particular web website, which again, um, will help you in your instruction. Do not forget, and we will actually go out to this website at the workshops that we're conducting, but TABE 11 and 12 keeps adding more and more materials, plus an online tools training. So here again, as we get more and more into the TABE 11 and 12, and probably a little more concerned with some things, this should be your website to go to, because what I have found in the short time that TABE 11 and 12 has been out is they are adding more resources for us to use. But everything from some sample test questions to what the online tools look like, so lots and lots of resources from TABE online. If you are using the CASAS, again, there's a CASAS website, and this it should be one that, here again, you go into on an ongoing basis so you get the most recent things on what is happening with that particular assessment tool. So, are those different sites, you know, limited somewhat? But we also know as a new instructor or a veteran who's getting back in, that sometimes you can get too many. So you didn't see any sites on actual academic things. So we didn't add the math, we didn't add this and this. You will get those as we go through this year. But hopefully this list gives you the assessment locations, it gives you the basic professional organizations. You have the governmental organizations, both our state and the federal, in one list so that you can start get started looking. Okay, and I think we have one question. Um, that deals with some of the state inmates with no computer access and internet access. And I will say there are ways around that. You do need to contact your state person because dependent upon the location, dependent upon the state, there is still a paper pencil GED test that does get used. So again, you just need to go through your, your state correctional person on that and get that information. Because you're right, we do have some state um, facilities that there's absolutely no computer access for anyone. And so, you know, that, that makes it very difficult. So good question. And that's true for TABE 11 and 12 as well. Yes. Okay. To finish up our few little tips before we end today, I just want to give you just kind of a, a quick overview of some things you may want to look at doing. The Florida IP Day website continues to have more and more resources. So if you went out there a year ago, please come back. If you went out there six months ago, please come back. And there's a lot of things that are going to be put up this year as well. If you're a new instructor or want a few more answers to things, there are e-learning modules on Florida IP Day. You can go at your own pace, et cetera, but there are modules on the GD. There's modules on college career readiness standards. There's modules on CASAs. 
And again, the TABE modules are getting redone as we speak. So that's a great way if you can't get to workshops and you can't always get into certain things. Or like I said, you're a new instructor and you don't want to ask everybody until you have an idea of what you're asking. These are great ways to get that introductory information. The other thing is try out the lesson plans. What, they've, what we've done on Florida IP Day is we've aligned all the lesson plans to um, the different standards. Everything is there for you to use, so you don't have to go out and, and search for stuff. Everything's encompassed in the lesson plans. Participate in the webinar Wednesdays. We have a diverse list of different things we're going to be doing, so it will be very interesting. We have videos up grab and go some of them very useful for you just to learn new techniques or strategies but also some you can use in the classroom we also have archived workshops and toolkits in fact they're under the esaw classroom although they could definitely be used in abe there's some career exploration kits with just short little reading passages in five different areas and like i said visit often because you never know what else will be there now this fall, we're going to be doing workshops. In fact, the first one just got completed this last week, and it's a little different than what we've done in the past. This year, what we're doing this fall is doing four mini workshops on one day. And so these will incorporate not only some workshops that were done this summer at the GED National Conference, but also some workshops that are developed just for Florida. One on the TABE 11 and 12, very much focused on the teacher in mind, not the tester. The other thing um, in two areas, actually in RLA, one that comes from the GED National Conference, and then one that we've developed to deal with grammar and structure, because we know there are a lot of test questions on the tape in that area. And another one, a math grab bag with all brand new hands-on activities that you can take back to the classroom tomorrow. So we have workshops that are going to go as far south as Dade County to as far north as Tallahassee and Live Oak, et cetera. So there should be something that's fairly close to you. So if you've got questions on these areas or want some strategies for the classroom, please, please make sure that you register now for those workshops. And to do that, you just go to the event calendar on the IP Day website. They're all loaded there. Okay. As we close, um, the other area that you do need to know is the reading association, or the reading association, I guess I call it that, but it's the Regional Educational Laboratory Southeast, um, is also doing some workshops for Florida IPDAY. Those are at current all up on the IPDAY website, and you'll register the same way. So, um, as we finish today, the webinar remember the recorded webinar a copy of the powerpoint and a copy of the workbook will be on florida ip day within the next 48 hours so make sure that you do go there and so as we finish today any other questions that anyone has i don't see any on the board I'm just really excited about all these exciting new things coming your way. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I am going to ask if you will give us about 60 seconds of your time to complete a very quick survey of three questions, and you should see them up there right now. And if you would, please, just click your answer to those three short questions. And I believe Joseph will have this up for about 60 seconds. And having said that, on behalf of June and myself, thank you so very much for being with us today. If you do have any questions down the road, you have both June's and my email as part of this PowerPoint. But we do look forward to seeing you at upcoming events. June, anything else? 
No, just a reminder that we'll have another webinar that's scheduled for September 19th. You can register for it now. And the title of that is Shift Happens. And with that, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.